I would like to thank uh, Leo Vilenchik and Lars uh, Dreyuga for inviting me to speak today about the Sporic Hebrew in the framework of the exhibition of the artistic group Diaspora. It seems Hebrew is coming back to Berlin. In the last years, we have seen an abundance of Hebrew events taking place in Berlin. Yesterday, we celebrated here a new Hebrew trans translation of the correspondence between Hannah Arendt and Gershom Scholem by my good friend Gadi Goldberg, uh, who lives and works and translates in Berlin. The group exhibition uh, exhibiting here today is mostly composed of Hebrew-speaking artists, not only, but mostly, and significantly is called Diasporas. But what is Diasporic Hebrew? Or more precisely, why is the concept of Diasporic Hebrew relevant today? Could it help us? Hebrew speakers, and I'm speaking in English, but I'm specifically referring to the Hebrew speakers among us, could it help us better understand or maybe even reappropriate our language here in Berlin? These are vast and difficult questions to which I don't hope to give final answers this evening. For the time being, my goal is to discuss the relevance today of the concept diasporic Hebrew to investigate the relationships, then and now, of Hebrew with what you may call its diasporic character, and to show, through a series of examples of language usage, how the diasporic character of Hebrew has been and still is being negated over and over again. Now, what is diaspora? The word diaspora stems from the Greek dia, throughout, and sperem, to sow. Um, it is a dispersion of people across geographic areas, seen as an analogy to the third type of dispersion of seeds. The word diaspora appears several times in the Greek translation of the Bible, the Septuagint, the Shirim, but not as a translation of Galut or Gola, the Hebrew for exile. Unlike Galut, the word diaspora does not necessarily refer to the result of a traumatic uprooting or expulsion. Unlike Galut, it does not imply a single point of origin or a geographic center. A diasporic condition is one in which people located in different places that have their own cultural and political particularities share a common sense of identity and engage in a network of communications and empathy that spreads across vast distances. Daniel Boyarin, in his forthcoming book, A Traveling Homeland, the Babylonian Talmud as Diaspora, chapters of which has been delivered, have been delivered in, in Berlin one year or two years ago. In this book, he suggests to approach diaspora as, and I quote, a particular kind of cultural hybridity and as a mode of analysis rather than as an essential thing. End of quote. Thus, he defines diaspora as, quote, a synchronic cultural situation applicable to people who participate in a doubled cultural and frequently linguistic location in which they share a culture with a place in which they dwell, but also with another group of people who lives elsewhere, in which they have a local and a translocal cultural identity at the same time. According to these definitions, Hebrew has been a diasporic language for more than 2,500 years, as it served as a common language of communication, literature, and study for a community that spread across Palestine, Babylonia, North Africa, Spain, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, the Americas, etc. In his essay on modern Hebrew, written in 1925, Franz Rosenzweig points exactly at the diasporic character of Hebrew, demonstrating how, constantly moving from place to place and always under the influence of other languages and cultures, Hebrew has accumulated numerous linguistic layers. The following citation is a bit long, but I think it is worth it. 
and is my translation. Hebrew was never frozen as a static image, but has always remained alive. The Hebrew of the Torah and of the Book of Esther, the exaltedness of the early prayers, the Piyutim, the articulated style of the Mishnayot, the Baroque of Elazar ben Kilil, and the classicism of the great Sephardim, the pious sobriety of Maimonides, Arambam, and the, stat, the steady and avid teaching of Rashi, the unscrupulousness of the Tibonim, the carelessness of Shulchan Aruch, the historicism of the Jewish Enlightenment, the Askala, in the 19th century, all of this is Hebrew. The spoken ancient Hebrew, the Aramaic common language of the Persian era, then the Greek in the Hellenistic period, then stronger and more enduring than everything else, the Aramaic of the, Babi of the Palestinian and Babylonian houses of study, and at the same time, the language of Rome's army and courts, and the language of the rulers and the subjects in the new Persian Empire, then the Arabic of Muslim doctors and philosophers, the languages of Europe, all of these have left their mark on the lexical and grammatical structures of Hebrew. Once Hebrew acquires something new, Rosenzweig tells us, it never gets lost. The language only becomes richer and richer. It's very important for Rosenzweig that Hebrew is not a living organism that lives and dies, or in the terms of Zionism, lives, dies, lives and dies a couple of times, right? Uh, for Rosenzweig, it is a treasure. It is a treasure that accommodates, it can only accommodate more and more and more Hebrew. Now, Rosenzweig admires precisely that doubled cultural and linguistic location of Hebrew, which we saw in Daniel Boyarin's definition of the diaspora. On the one hand, Hebrew constantly maintains translocal relations with itself, moving from place to place and creating a whole that a, um, sorry, creating a whole that is the sum of its spatial and temporal parts. On the other hand, that constantly moving Hebrew is always influenced by its surrounding cultures and languages, right? It is always in contact with the particularities, with the local culture where it is. Um, another manifestation of the Hebrew uh, diasporic uh, character is to be found in the function, in its function as a language that connects Jews all around the world. In his last book on Semitic languages, published in, in 2013, the linguist Gideon Goldenberg similarly characterizes Hebrew as a word language of the Jews with an unbroken continuity. And I quote, Hebrew has always remained for the Jews all over the world like no other idiom the principal productive language of general education, learning and culture, religion, creative literature, poetry, philosophy, science, correspondence, and occasional oral communication until modern times. A good example for this diasporic characterization of Hebrew is the halachic tra tractate of Maimonides, Arambam, Mishneh Torah, which you probably heard, written in the 12th century, Maimonides, who wrote predominantly in Arabic, decided to write this masterpiece in Hebrew in order to reach beyond the already vast area of Arabic-speaking Jews and to address the entire Jewish diaspora. In doing so, Maimonides relied on the fact that Hebrew was a lingua franca. Uh, I will define it for you. A lingua franca is a shared intermediary language used by people across different localities and cultures. Speakers of a lingua franca may live in different places and cultural settings and may also speak different languages, but they all share a common interest to communicate with one another. This interest may be cultural, economic, religious, or other. It doesn't matter. Every lingua franca, by definition, is diasporic. Now, if Hebrew is indeed a diasporic language by its very essence of being a lingua franca, does that not make the designation diasporic Hebrew completely redundant? 
following the historical process in which it was dis dispersed across vast distances and became a lingua franca, Hebrew is, by definition, diasporic. The adjective diasporic, when applied to Hebrew, thus, seems to be superfluous. Right? Superfluous. Yes. Thank you. I would like to explain now why the adjective diasporic has unfortunately become necessary. In fact, the concept diasporic Hebrew is relevant only in light of the ideology that negates the diaspora. Without the opposition to a Hebrew which claims to be non-diasporic, the concept of diasporic Hebrew would be irrelevant. Thus, instead of defining what diasporic Hebrew means, my task in this talk would be to explore the ways in which the diasporic character of Hebrew has been marginalized and negated by an anti-diasporic ideology that attempts to anchor Hebrew exclusively in one territory. So actually, I like you. This is not a talk about what is diasporic Hebrew. It is a talk about what is anti-diasporic Hebrew. The mainstream ideology in Zionism combined the negation of the diaspora with a claim to make Hebrew the only national language of the Jewish people. By doing that, it has inscribed Hebrew with territorializing and diaspora-rejecting linguistic practices, as we shall see later. I personally know of no other national movement that is grounded to such an extent on negating the cultural, moral, and historical validity of life outside of its assumed national territory. The he hegemonic power of this ideology renders the concept diasporic Hebrew indispensable, since without it, such Hebrew, I mean diasporic Hebrew, remains concealed and suppressed. As a consequence of the success of the anti-diasporic doctrine in territorializing Hebrew, expressions in Hebrew are understood as territorially bound by default, unless otherwise stated. It is important to state that diasporic Hebrew is not in opposition to language concepts such as modern Hebrew, or Zionist Hebrew, or Palestinian Hebrew, or even Israeli Hebrew. All of these are part of Hebrew, right? I am following here on Rosenzweig's understanding of Hebrew. All of these are part of Hebrew which, as I said before, is essentially diasporic. They are also part of the diasporic Hebrew. The doctrine of the negation of the diaspora, which renders the concept of diasporic Hebrew uh, uh, relevant, was not part of all Zionist strips. Okay? The negation of the diaspora did not start in Palestine. It started in Europe, much before the foundation of the State of Israel. We will return to this point later. Simon Ravidovich, who moved to Berlin in 1919 from the war devastated Poland and soon became a key figure in the Hebrew scene of Berlin in the Weimar Republic, uh, rejected Achad Ahan's view that Palestine should be the spiritual center for the Jewish diaspora and promoted the idea of two centers for the Jewish people, one in the land of Israel and one in the diaspora. As an avid promoter of Hebrew uh, uh, culture, literature, study, and education in the diaspora, Rabidovich founded in Berlin in 1930 this association, Brit Ivrit Olamit, which we can maybe already translate as World Hebrew Union. And I would argue that this title is an early manifestation of the concept of diasporic Hebrew. Now, Brit Ivrit Olamit, World Hebrew Union, let's say, was born in the context of the power struggle between various Hebrewist and Zionist streams on the role of Hebrew culture, literature, and education in the diaspora and in Palestine. While the mainstream within the Zionist movement sought to bound Hebrew to the territory of Palestine and to devalue its presence in the diaspora, 
Rabinovich fought for the importance of Hebrew in the diaspora from within the Zionist camp, right? Throughout all his life, Rabinovich saw himself as a Zionist. The movement of Brit Ivritolomi was consolidated in a conference organized by Rabinovich here in Berlin in June 1931. In the opening session, Rabinovich advocated the cultivation of Hebrew culture in the diaspora as much as in Palestine. And he, he, he says, and I'm quoting, wherever there is a Jewish community, there is a center of Jewish creativity, and the land of Israel should not fear such centers of creativity. On the contrary, it needs them. And, end of quote. In his speech, he stresses that the Jewish question cannot be solved by the land of Israel alone, and suggests a model of a partnership between the land of Israel and the diaspora. Throughout his speech, he criticizes the doctrine of the negation of the diaspora. The spiritual center of diasporic Jewry cannot be for Ravidovich in the land of Israel, but must be in the diaspora itself. In the last part of his speech, Ravidovich proposes that the seat of the diasporic Hebrew association, the Brit Ibrikolomit, should be in Berlin. Now, the significance of the word Olamit, this is why I wanted to wait with the translation of Brit Ibrikolomit, okay? The significance of the word Olamit, which we can translate as of the world, right? Not world, of the world, is a better translation. And the significance of this word in reference to the diaspora should be traced to the tradition of its, usage, of its usage in the Hebrew concept Am Olam. Am Olam, literally, people of the world, or the eternal people, was a concept used in rabbinical Hebrew to refer to the Jewish people, a people that does not belong to a specific place, but is scattered through, throughout the world, and at the same time, a people whose history is as old as the world's history. Right? In Hebrew, olam has both the temporal meaning, denoting eternity, like le olam, right? and a spatial meaning, denoting the world. This term was adopted as the, as the name of a Jewish political movement, which, following the pogroms of, uh, in, in the, uh, the pogroms of 1881 in Russia, Okay, so I again. This term was adopted as the name of a Jewish political movement which, following the pogroms of 1881 in Russia, advocated the emigration of Jews to the United States. The Amola movement was, of course, a political alternative to the Chorvei Zion movement, which was founded at the same time as a proto-Zionist movement. Remember the name Chorvei Zion, because we will return to it later. Of the Beit Zion, the lovers of Zion. Very good. In the beginning of the 20th century, the historian Simon Dubno adopted the, the concept Amolam, the, the people of the world, in the Hebrew title of his monumental history of the Jews, that was called Divrei Yemei Amolam, which we can translate to the history of the world people. As he explains in the preface to the Hebrew edition, the title of his book refers to the history of the people whose location is the whole world and whose time is eternity. Ravidovich, yeah, eternity. Ravidovich, a disciple and admirer of Dubno, the diasporist, used the adjective Olamit in reference to Hebrew precisely in this double sense. It is important, double, right, because it's both spiritual and temporal. It is important to note that neither Dubnov nor Havidovich were opponents of Zionism. The latter clearly saw himself as a Zionist. Dubnov is a bit more complicated, but, but both of them, in parts of their careers, were either Zionists or sympathizers of Zionism. But both struggled vehemently against the Zionist doctrine uh, uh, of the negation of the diaspora. Um, yeah. Both of them were Zionists, but within Zionism have fought the doctrine of the negation of the diaspora. Um, now, what I'm trying to, to say is that these early conceptualizations of the diasporic Hebrew 
in the, in the association political economy it came necessarily as a reaction to the negation of the diaspora. They would not have come to the world had there not been a doctrine and ideology that negates the diaspora. Again, I'm trying to explain why I'm speaking about diaspora. Now, up until now, I have dealt with diasporic Hebrew as a concept. Now, I would like to discuss some features of the language itself, or more precisely, features that have been rejected, suppressed, or transformed in an effort to anchor Hebrew in a single territory, thus negating its diasporic character. The doctrine of the negation of the diaspora has, on the one hand, suppressed certain features of Hebrew, and on the other hand, inscribed it with territorializing and diaspora-rejecting linguistic practices. The attempts to suppress the diasporic character of Hebrew and to imagine a non-diasporic Hebrew may be uncovered through an archaeology of contemporary Hebrew, our Hebrew, Ashkenaz, uh, which is a term that uh, originally <coughs> meant Germany, and later was expanded, I don't want to speak about it too much, but I would like to say that Ashkenaz, the place where we are right now, is a very good place to start this excavation. Although it must not remain the only one, okay? Uh, Louis Gleinert writes in the preface to his book Hebrew in Ashkenaz from 1993, and I quote, just as the desire to revitalize Hebrew has been bound up with the desire to get rid of Yiddish, so it has sought to reject the old-style Hebrew of Ashkenaz, its sounds and words, and the knowledge of it. End of quote. Let us now begin the investigation with elements that were rejected because of their diasporic connotation to Ashkenazic Hebrew. Now, linguists of Hebrew are showing today a growing interest in the Yiddish substratum behind modern Hebrew, reconstructing how a great part of Hebrew's grammar, idioms, and vocabulary derive from different sorts of translations from Yiddish to Hebrew. Scholars have also dealt extensively with the secularization of Hebrew, a topic that became particularly popular following the discovery of Gershom Scholem's essay dedicated to Franz Rosenzweig on that subject. However, to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever discussed the phenomenon of Hebrew to Hebrew translations, whose only purpose was to reject the diasporic heritage of Hebrew. Don't worry, I will give you examples. I will now give you three such examples for this kind of anti-diasporic translations. Davar Acher. Or in, or in its Ashkenazic Yiddish pronunciation, Dover literally another thing, was the standard euphemism in Hebrew for pig or pork. You would not say he eats pig or pork, you would say he eats Dover okay, something else. Outside religious circles, this euphemism has been widely forgotten among Hebrew speakers, as it was gradually replaced by another euphemism, basar lavaz, white meat, literally, white meat. Now, restaurants in Tel Aviv, for example, still write basar lavaz in their menus when serving pork. The fact that one euphemism was replaced by another euphemism rules out the possibility that this was an act of secularization or profanation, right? The euphemism remains. The euphemism Basar Laban is motivated still by a Jewish taboo on pork, as much as the Varachel was. No difference. It seems that the only advantage of the new euphemism Basar Laban over the traditional one was in its distancing from the Hebrew words and sounds of the diaspora. The term the Varachel was probably replaced by a generation of Hebrew speakers who were still exposed to, to the sound of Ashkenazic Hebrew in Yiddish. Right? The Varachel reminded them of Dover Achel, an accent which carried for them 
a strong diasporic connotation. Masala pan, on the other hand, white meat, was without tradition, an expression whose pronunciation could not be mistaken for a diasporic one. More than basar lavan was a euphemism for pork, it was a euphemism for the diasporic sounding dover -acher. Okay? A double euphemism. The next example for a Hebrew-Hebrew translation is also an example for the limited success of the anti-diasporic ideology in Hebrew. As much as the attempts to suppress the diasporic character of Hebrew were potent and influential, they were never completely successful. And Hebrew, which never was fully territorialized or de-diasporized, also bears witness of the failures of the anti-diasporic doctrine. My next example is Mekah. Few Hebrew speakers know today that this word was the standard word in Ashkenazic Hebrew for price. Right? To ask for the mekach of something was to ask for its price. What is the mekach of this? Okay? This one is Hebrew. Um, the word mekach was replaced by mechir for the same reasons <coughs> that Basar Lavan replaced the Vahir. I don't give you the examples, but all these documents. I mean, the moment where it was replaced and the reasons why it was replaced uh, for this reason are documented in my research. The word mekach continues to exist in Hebrew in the expressions la moda la mekach and mekach uimka, both, both of them mean to bargain. To bargain, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An activity, of course, associated with the negative stereotypes of diasporic Jews. But the day to day word of commerce, such as price, had to be freed from this diasporic connotation. And thus, Mekah was replaced to a Hebrew synonym that was less current in Ashkenazi Hebrew, that was not a part of Ashkenazi Hebrew. Just like in the case of Dover Rache, the fact that the word Mekah is also a word in Yiddish did not help its survival in the anti diasporic Hebrew. In the case of Mecca, we find traces for the intentional suppression of its diasporic meaning in Hebrew. Uh, sorry. We find traces for the in uh, intentional suppression of its diasporic meaning in Hebrew textbooks written by language purists who explicitly associated it with Yiddish. Right? You have books, for example, written in the 50s, uh, giving tips to Hebrew speakers. Uh, what words should not be said, how you should say certain words, right? Tikkun uh, HaRashon. And you have this example coming again and again. Don't say Mekah to say price, say Mechir, which is not the next point. The same, the same language purists also try to correct the pronunciation of Mekah to its biblical pronunciation, Mikah. Who among you know that the word Mekah should be pronounced Mikah, right? Maybe one, two, great. Uh, not only they did not succeed, and we still say la moda la mekach and not al mikach, right? But the allegedly incorrect pronunciation mekach is in itself a great example for the diasporic vitality of Hebrew. The change in the pronunciation from mikach to mekach did not occur in Ashkenaz. A variant of the pronunciation of that word is already documented in North Africa in the 11th century, from which it traveled in the 12th century to southern France, to northern France, and only later to Ashkenaz at around the 16th century. You see that all of this time we speak about spoken Hebrew. Right? We have docu documents, uh, uh, grammarians, saying that I hear people say Mecca, and it's wrong, they should say Nika. This, this is how we know that. The word was spoken in all of those centuries, in all of those places. Even if the primary meaning of Mecca has changed, the fact that we still pronounce it that way is a great symbol for the continuity of the diasporic tradition of Hebrew. My last example for an anti-diasporic Hebrew-Hebrew translation, which is maybe a bit uh, more dramatic than the last two, is the coinage of the word Shoah as a replacement for the word Churban 
poets, Ashkenazic Yiddish pronunciation, Chum. This was the immediate, Chum was the immediate and most frequently used word by the victims themselves to describe the genocide of the Jews in Europe. It was used both in Yiddish and in Hebrew, now I don't know how it was pronounced, but in texts, as Chuban, it was uh, uh, used both in Yiddish and in Hebrew, in the ghettos, and uh, uh, also outside of Europe, by the overwhelming majority of Jews worldwide. The fact that Chuban was also a word in Yiddish, with a characteristic diasporic connotation and an undeniable Ashkenazic sound to it, made it unbearable to the ideology, uh, ideological hegemony in the first years of the State of Israel, when the negation of the diaspora, of course, was at its highest peak. In the early 1950s, the word Shoah was officially introduced in the State of Israel to replace the word Chobun or Choban. Since then, the word Shoah had its own diaspora, mostly due to Claude Lanzmann's documentary Shoah from 1985, which spread this word in many languages and places uh, that uh, today, they today remain ignorant of the word Choban, as some of you might also imagine. This should suffice for now, as there is no enough time for a detailed examination of the full historical, political, and theological significance of the tra transition of translation from Chum to Shoah. It's really a, a, a theme for the whole other lecture. Now, let us move now from anti-diasporic etymologies to territorializing semantics. It is important to know that the ideology of negating the diaspora has been so pervasive among Hebrew speakers that many of these anti-diasporic transformations occurred from below, often unconsciously, and independent of an official language planning. I would like to begin with, this very, with a very particular case, sorry, I would like to begin with a very peculiar case of the word kan. It means here. Words like now, here, this, today are called in linguistics deictic words. It means that they are relative words that require some context of time and place in order to understand in a given, in order to be understood in a given situation. When we say here, we, in principle, we do not always mean the same place, right? The, at least in English. Uh, the contextual meaning, I see some people smiling and laughing. Maybe other people know what I'm going to speak about. The contextual meaning of the ictic word relies on what linguists call a deictic center. That is, a point in place, a, sorry, a point in space and time from which these words are expressed. In most cases, the deictic center moves together with the speaker. Okay? The territorializing of Hebrew has been so pervasive that I often hear, and I'm interested if other people here has noticed that, that I often hear Hebrew speakers in Berlin, also in Paris where I live now, and in other places, using the word kan to refer to the territory of the state of Israel, rather than to the place where they actually are. Right? Comparing, for example, uh, Berlin to kan, saying it here. Okay, I see some people Nodding, meaning that they heard it, and other people doing like this, meaning that they didn't or didn't pay enough attention. Please write me if you hear it. I'm very interested. But also the other way around. That is also interesting. Move back to Israel sometimes. I'm saying great. Here, good. So there's hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, in other languages, when people travel, they usually take their deistic centers with them constantly updating the contextual meaning of words like here. This is not always the case, it is sometimes the case, but it is not always the case in Hebrew. The territorializing force in Hebrew did not change the meaning of words like kan, but it managed to shift, in certain cases, the, de the deictic center of Hebrew from a subjective, contextual center to a collective center 
that is anchored in an unchanging territory. It is as if when Hebrew is spoken or written, it assumes the territory of the state of Israel as its automatic point of reference. I do not know of any other language in which the deictic center can sometimes be static and fixed to a distant location. Now another example for the anchoring of the deictic center of Hebrew in a particular territory can be found in what I like to call the, the anti-diasporic definite article, or in Hebrew, like hey, <laughs> In literature and newspapers, up to the second half of the 20th century, the word Haaretz, the land, was a relative designation. Haaretz meant Russia when one was in Russia. It meant Germany when one was in Germany. And it meant Iraq when one was in Iraq. Today, a Palestinian-centric point of reference is inscribed in Hebrew usage to such a degree that saying Haaretz is automatically interpreted as referring to the territory of the state of Israel. Even if I speak here in Germany, for example. All Hebrew speakers know what I'm talking about. Those who are not Hebrew speakers can look at their friends and see them know. <laughs> it is important to know that calling the land of Israel Haaretz is not a modern phenomenon and has a long textual tradition. Calling the land of Israel Haaretz uh, is not at all an anti-diasporic act. Okay? I did not say that I'm not saying it. What the negation of diaspora, what the negation of the diaspora has achieved is that it is no longer thinkable to call any other language Haaretz. Right? This is what it, it has achieved. Hey, thank you very much. It says it in the country, right? <laughs> it is not longer thinkable to call any other country Haaretz, right? It's, it seems like a joke if somebody would say Haaretz and refer to Germany. <laughs> Unless it's me. Okay. <laughs> okay, we move to this later. The territorializing process in Hebrew has created an abundance of expressions that follow the same uh, linguist pattern, this definite article whose signification has been similarly constrained to a specific territory. Hamatzar does not refer to any condition, but to the political situation in the state of Israel. Hatik Shovet necessarily denotes, denotes, denotes sorry, the Israeli press. Hatzafa cannot be used to refer to any other army than the Israeli one. You say Hatzafa Germany, the German army, Hatzafa America. But if you are in the United States and you say Hatzavah, it means necessarily that you speak about the Israeli army, etc. Et These concepts were all once relative in Hebrew. They were all territorialized and rendered non operative in reference to any other place than the territory which assumed a complete monopoly on the Hebrew language. Now, anti-diasporic processes within Hebrew have also created a specific vocabulary to devalue Jewish immigration from the state of Israel. The most known example that I'm also sure even the non-Hebrew speakers among us have heard about, the most known of some of them, the most known example is the anti-diasporic neologism Yerida which characterizes emigration from Palestine as descending, right? as going down from a high place. It is based, of course, on the traditional concept Aliyah, going up to the land of Israel, whose theological contents have been completely secularized by this anti-diasporous Hebrew to denote, to, de to denote the simple emigration of Jews to the state of Israel. Of course, the concept of Aliyah is not a modern one. Yet in that, is a modern one. And um, while the altitude metaphor in reference to the land of Israel has a long theological tradition, <coughs> the word Yerida uh, and its linguistic der derivatives, La Redet, Yodin, and so on, became the standard way to refer in Hebrew to emigration from the state of Israel and a key concept in the negation of the diaspora. For those of you who don't know Hebrew, it's not just, it's not a 
a word that is particularly loaded, right? You wouldn't, um, you wouldn't be surprised if somebody would call a person who, who, who left, who emigrated from the, uh, from the state of Israel as a Yoreg. That would be actually the standard way to refer to people who emigrate from uh, the state of Israel. Right? I'm trying to show how, how inscribed uh, is the anti-diasporic doctrine within you. A more recent anti-diasporic linguist phenomenon in Hebrew is the usage of the verb lehit goreo to describe Jews who left the state of Israel, of course only Jews, uh, and chose to live in the diaspora. For a couple of decades, Hebrew has maintained a distinction between the verbs lakur, to dwell, and lehit goreo, to dwell temporarily. Okay? In recent years, lehit goreo has become more and more dominant as a verb used to describe Jews who emigrated from the state of Israel and dwelt in the diaspora. I'm speaking about uh, textual analysis of, of newspapers and other descriptions of uh, uh, emigrants from the state of Israel, where the usage of the word lehit goreh, in reference to uh, the life uh, where they chose to live, uh, has gained an amazing increase in the last, truly in the last couple of decades. It's quite a recent phenomenon. The recent Hebrew dictionary, Rav Milim, which defines the, the verb lehit goreh as to dwell in a specific place temporarily or for a limited period of time, I don't know what is the difference, but that's the definition, uh, provides the following example. I will say in Hebrew and then translate Who meet Gorer be Anglia, the Parmain be Shana, Bale be Kurbat. This is the only example. <laughs> he dwells in England and comes twice a year for a visit in the land. <coughs> Now, this example demonstrates well the way in which the verb lehit goreh qualifies the life of Israeli immigrants from a perspective that negates the diaspora. Life in the diaspora is portrayed temporary and peripheral to the only place where Jews can live a full life, according to the anti-diasporic doctrine, for example, in the writings of Aleph Bet Yoshua. And it may also be added that the reflexive uh, verbal paradigm in which this verb in, is constructed, it fael, right? It goreh, uh, carries often the meaning of only pretending to do something, of putting a show, making as if. Uh, for example, for those of you who know Hebrew, lehit uh, nakeh means uh, in Hebrew to act as a stranger, as if you are a stranger, nochri, right? Lehit uh, means to do as if one is righteous, but actually is not right. It's something that is not true or completely authentic. So does Lehit Gorel or Lehit Tamer, is also a good example, right? To make as if one has been exempted, but actually is not. So does Lehit Gorel can be interpreted as doing as if one dwells, dwells or lives somewhere, whereas the dwelling is not complete or entirely authentic. After having spoken of day-to-day anti-diasporic practices in Hebrew, I would like to offer two short conceptual histories that would further illuminate the process of anti-diasporization and territorialization of Hebrew. An investigation of these concepts is necessary here for their central role both in diasporic Hebrew and in its negationist uh, doctrine. I will begin with Zion, Zion. Considering the political importance of the concept of Zionism during the last hundred years, it is surprising that no one, to my knowledge, has yet offered a truly thorough gen gen genealogy of that concept. <coughs> what I offer here is merely a sketch of a much longer conceptual history that is still in the preparation. The terms Zionist and Zionism were first coined in 1890 in German by the Jewish journalist and thinker Nathan Birenbaum. Uh, 
and were later popularized by Theodor Herzl in his Judenstaat, the state of the Jews, we we'll get to that, uh, written in 1896. The term Zionism is based on the name of the political movement Chovevei Zion, Lovers of Zion. Remember, I told you to remember that, right? uh, Which this, this political movement, Chovevei Zion, has emerged in Russia in the 1870s and 1880s as a reaction to waves of anti-Semitism uh, in Russia at the time. This movement, whose ideology and goals were diversified and constantly changing, is considered as a predecessor of political Zionism. For the mainstream historiography of Zionism, this is usually where the etymological investigation stops. Right? The name Lovers of Zion is, a, is just interpreted using some, some verses in the Bible where the word Zion comes with, um, with the descriptions that can be interpreted as uh, connected to the gathering of the diaspora, bringing the Jews back to, back to uh, uh, the Promised Land, but there's no true uh, conceptual history or genealogy, genealogy of the term lovers of Zion, Chorvei Zion. The name Lovers of Zion is based on a frequent Hebrew name pattern for cultural political associations such as Chevrat Dorshe Lishon Ever, Chevrat Shoharei Hatu Vatushiya, or later Chovevei Sfat Ever, Lovers of the Hebrew Language. In his contribution to the forthcoming diasporic Hebrew journal Mikan Gelach, Ofri Ilani, who is also among us, shows us that the group Chevrat Dorshe Lishon Ever who published the Hebrew journal Hanayasef in the late 18th century, took its name from an expression used by Protestant Hebraists in Germany, Liebhaber der Hebräischer Sprache, the Hebräischen Sprache, lovers of the Hebrew language. Now, this is a very important aspect of the etymology of Chorvei Zion, that was completely forgotten, negated, not negated, just uh, um, ignored. But now we should ask, why lovers of Zion? Zion is the name of Jerusalem. If Chovevei Zion was essentially about immigration to Palestine, as they are portrayed in Zionist historiography, which is partly true, partly it's more complicated, why didn't they call themselves Chovevei Eretz Israel? Lovers of the land of Israel, for example. Why Chovevei Zion? What has escaped the attention of scholars is that Chovevei Zion was a word, a word, and you are hearing this for the first time, for the first time. <laughs> what has escaped the attention of scholars is that Chovevei Zion was a word play on a much older Hebrew expression, Sonei Zion, <laughs> haters of Zion. Today, only Orthodox Jews, or very learned people, still know uh, that, uh, sorry, Today, only Orthodox Jews still know that, but for hundreds of years, both in Hebrew and in Yiddish, and let us not forget that Yiddish was the mother tongue of the founders of Chovevei Zion, the expression Sonei Zion was a standard expression to denote Jew haters. Okay? What we would call today anti Semites. Sonei Zion. That was the way in Ashkenazic Hebrew and Yiddish to refer to people who hate Jews, to Gentiles who hate Jews. Jews, the movement of Zion was above all a reaction to the rampant, you will see in a second how it connects, don't worry. The movement of Zion was above all a reaction to the rampant anti-Semitism in Russia in the second half of the 19th century. The name of the movement, Lovers of Zion, was simply an inventive antonym for the traditional way Jews called anti-Semites, right? There was this word. Sonetzion, and they said, so we will be Chorvetzion. We could translate it to Philosemites if you want. Okay? Now, the way in which Sonetzion came to signify Jew haters deserves a closer examination because it is diasporic. The source of this expression is the song of, of ascents, Shira Malot. 
יבושו ויסוגו אחור כל שונאי ציון. May all who hate Zion be turned back in shame. Psalm 129 verse 5. <laughs> the Hebrew grammarian and commentator David Kimfi Haradak, who lived in southern France in the 12th century, provides the following interpretation to that verse. Hagoim אינם שונאים את ציון, אבל אוהבים אותה, עד שנלחמים בעבורה גוי עם גוי. אלא פירושו, שונאי ציון, שונאי בני ציון, והם ישראל. Writing in the time of the Crusades, Kimchi refers to the wars between Christians and Muslims on Jerusalem. The, the expression haters of Zion cannot be interpreted literally. For the Gentiles do not hate Zion, on the contrary, they love Zion, for they fight for it between themselves. The expression haters of Zion must therefore be interpreted as haters of the children of Zion, who are Israel, the Jews. Zion, like Israel, are names for the Jewish people. Kimchi's interpretation is a fine example of the de-territorialization process that is so characteristic to diasporic Hebrew. For Kimchi and for subsequent generations, the concept Zion is transcended from the geographic city of Jerusalem and expands to refer to the Jewish people in all times and all places, to the Am Olam, the, the world people. Kimchi, David Kimchi reads the text into his own contemporary circumstances. Generations of Jews have done the same and applied Sonetzion to their contexts. Now, by taking the name Chovevetzion, the founders of this movement have paid homage to a long tradition of Zion as a deterritorialized concept. But at the same time, their movement was the first step towards the re-territorialization of Zion that would culminate in the name of the territorializing ideology par excellence, Zionism. The re-territorialization of Zion and the semantic shift that it underwent from signifying the Jewish people to signifying the territory of the Zionist project brings us to the second and last key concept I would like to discuss in this talk the concept Israel. God, we spoke about it yesterday. Maybe. For thousands of years, Israel has been the name of the Jewish people. At least for the last hundreds of years, Israel has also been the most frequent name for Jews by Jews, both in Hebrew and, of course, in Yiddish. It's all. Most people understand today the name Medinat Israel, the state of Israel, as if it were Hamedina Israel, Israel the state. Most people do not even know that Medinat Israel originally meant the state of the Jews, and that it was coined by Yitzhak Fernhoff in 1896 as a translation of Theodor Herzl's Judenstadt, the state of the Jews. Okay? Medinat Israel was simply the first translation of Herzl's Judenstein that was published at the same year. Okay? It was a translation, immediate translation. <laughs> All of this would not be so interesting and so important if the Declaration of Independence of the newly founded state would just have given this, uh, uh, this name as the name of the state. Just, if it would just be Medinat Israel, we would all know today that the state is called Medinat Israel because it is the state of the Jews. But we don't know it, right? Because I didn't know it. I didn't know it. I had to learn it. Uh, and there's a reason. The Declaration of Independence, and I also send you to read it, it's in Wikipedia. It has two, it's very short, it has two different paragraphs that define two different names for the state. The first paragraph defines the name of the state as Medinat Israel. 
אנחנו מכריזים בזאת על הקמת מדינה יהודית בארץ ישראל, היא מדינת ישראל. Well, the second paragraph merely calls it Israel. המדינה היהודית אשר תיקרא בשם ישראל. Using the word Israel as the name of that state constitutes the most aggressive act of de-diasporization de and territorialization both of Hebrew and of the Jewish people as a whole. The name of the world people, of the Jews, has been confiscated to refer from uh, uh, has been confiscated to refer from now on to the sorry, has been confiscated and now it refers to the place it refers to the territory which according to the Zionist ideology should be the solution of the Jewish question and bring an end to the diaspora. Simon Ravidovich, the same Simon Ravidovich that I spoke about before, who found a British literal meeting in Berlin in the 30s, infuriated by this appropriation, has written extensively on the subject and has demonstrated many times how this usage negates Jewish life in the diaspora by robbing the Jews of their traditional name. Ravidovich wrote a number of letters to David Ben Gurion the founder of the State of Israel and its first Prime Minister, in which he protests the name Israel for the State. He also tells him, please don't call it both Israel and the State of Israel, just call, call it the State of Israel. Stop calling it Israel. It also creates an ambig ambiguity. And in one of his replies, Ben Gurion writes back to Ravidovich, and I quote, Hashem Israel, I cannot do the accent, <laughs> השם ישראל, וצר לי על רוגזך בעניין זה, מוקדש מאז ארבע וחצי ביום ארבע עשרה במאי אלף תשע מאות ארבעים ושמונה, אך ורק למדינה היהודית. סנס מי פורטין, אייטין פורטי אייט, את פור תרדי פי אם, the name Israel, and I'm sorry if this makes you angry, is exclusively reserved to the Jewish state. Jews living in the, end of quote, Jews living in the diaspora, Ben Gurion writes explicitly in this letter, are not allowed anymore to use the name Israel. If they want to be a part of Israel, he writes, they must go and live in the state of Israel, which he does not call the state of Israel, he calls it Israel. Now, the territorialization of the word Israel is the best documented instance of an anti-diasporic transformation in Hebrew that was completely conscious and intentional. The linguist, also we know exactly when it happened. <coughs> he says it, right? He gives the hour. The, linguist, the linguistic and political implications of this are far-reaching. Since 1948, and to this very day, no official decision has ever been taken as to whether the name of the state is Israel or Medinat Israel. If you go to the website, if you go to the official publications, sometimes it's Medinat Israel, sometimes it's Israel, it's part of the thing. This ambiguity, uh, which I believe is intentional, at least for Ben Gurion, is responsible to the constant confusions between the state of Israel and the Jews. A confusion that remains today a crucial tool for the Zionist ideology. Okay, don't I need to explain to you how we can speak about later. Linguistically, we can no longer understand, let alone produce, expressions such as Israel by Europa, or Israel by Russia, Israel by Germany, right? Israel in Europe, Israel in Germany, Israel in, in Russia, that were the standard ways in Hebrew to say Jews in Europe, or the European Jews. Jews in Germany, right? We don't even understand this text anymore. When we read the text, it was written before 48, that says Israel the Russia. No, Israel is not in Russia. We don't, we don't understand it, okay? Um, it meant the Jews of Russia. Um, I lost it. Right. The loss for diasporic Hebrew is even greater if we consider the way that the concept Israel has been traditionally used in Hebrew following the preposition in, be, 
in Hebrew. Base rank in Israel. To say, for example, that Gerhard Scholens, I referred to yesterday, Gerhard Scholens' name in Israel, Shmo Israel, was Gershon Scholens, simply meant that among Jews he was called Gershon. A city in Israel, Ir Be Israel, has been the standard way in Hebrew to refer to a city that was important for Jews. Berlin was called Ir Be Israel or Im Ir Ve'em Be Israel in many, many, many different occasions. But today, to say that Berlin is a city in Israel would sound like a joke. We won't understand it. Right? Like to say Haaretz. We don't understand it anymore. We cannot say it. In diasporic Hebrew, when one would speak about a minhag be Israel, one would speak about a Jewish custom. Not about, a, right today, minhag be Israel would be interpreted among Hebrew speakers as a custom that is common in the state of Israel. Actually, there are many, many instances that you don't even know, even in modern Hebrew, that you don't even know if, if people are referring to the state of Israel or people are referring to the Jews. This, you have it a lot in political slogans. And if somebody is good for Israel or bad for Israel, what does it mean? Good for the Jews? Good for the state of Israel? And I think, again, this ambiguity is, is an essential part of this um, ideological complex that in many ways also paralyzes our ways to, to, to express certain things that we used to, to be able to express. Okay, I would like to come to a conclusion, and I would like to say a few words on what can be done in the present, and particularly here, come, by Berlin. One, what, and how can we write and speak Hebrew desperately? All the examples that I gave here should be taken as food for thought. They should not be used to create some set of rigid rules or a list of forbidden words and expressions uh, for writing diasporic or, or uh, for writing or, or speaking diasporic Hebrew. Okay? This is the last thing that I, I, I try to say that stop saying Mechir, say Mekach. That's not what I'm saying. No, no, no. I'm coming back to Rosenstein. Hebrew will absorb its anti-diasporic phase as it has absorbed all of the other literary periods before. As Rosenzweig has suggested in the 1920s, it will be accumulated to the whole that is called Hebrew, a whole that is essentially diasporic, that cannot be undone. What has been done cannot be undone and should not be undone. Much more than a product of the negation of the diaspora, our Hebrew is a product of thousands of years of diasporic production. We may not know it, but it's true. We should not negate or be ashamed by our mother tongue, nor try to clean it or to reverse it. Our project is not to bring it back to the past. The archaeology that I'm suggesting here, that we should do, is an archaeology of the present, of the language that we speak now. What I believe we should do, and this I would like to say in Hebrew, it's difficult to say it in another language, is le'adken et ha'ivrit Now the word le'adken comes from the expression adkan, up to here, up to now. And this is precisely the sense that I'm suggesting it. Let us bring our Hebrew here, to Berlin, to Europe, to the diaspora, not only by speaking, listening, writing, and reading it, but also by rethinking its place. Let's update our deictic center and write and speak Hebrew from here and now. To write and speak Hebrew diasporically means to think diasporically. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can hear you, but I don't know if it's <laughs>
Nowadays, uh, you see not, not in many aspects, uh, but in, in, um, um, on the mentions of internal markets and places, it's a Oh, that's great. And <laughs> it's been so for years, it, it's not uh, anything new. Basal Yeah. For it, years? Yeah, I've been seeing for years. If you go, uh, you mean years, you mean like five years? Or years or ten years? If you buy some, uh, if you buy some, um, of course, obviously, um, uh, meat, and then you look at the, uh, at the, um, at the notes, uh, stating the nutrition, so you, they uh, state, uh, I, I don't know, uh, some meat, and then, uh, the salah. And, and this is. I love it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I think it's a great symbol, right? I mean, I have never seen it, but uh, I've never seen it, truly. Uh, but I, of course, believe that it exists, and uh, I think it's 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 great. And uh, I, mean, I, it's think a I think it's uh, actually a, a very common to say the salacha in here. Any, any in other Hebrew, person here has heard the salacha? Now that she says it, I hear I have heard it. How many years ago? I, I, I only heard recently in fact that it was circulating some text from religious groups and I, I, I don't remember exactly, but it was circulating as a joke about it. People were laughing at it at this turn because it, it seemed like an extreme uh, euphemism, which was, it seemed ridiculous. And uh, so I'm not sure it's really common. Uh, people thought it as a joke. They saw, I don't know the details, but is, is there a question? Do you have something else? Are you all to Just the... maybe last with give your microphone and that would be a signal that you can speak. <laughs> there were two other uh, very nice uh, expressions for folk. Uh, one was Bakal Namu. Yeah. Uh, uh, I know Amy Namu. Yeah, and the other one which was uh, a little bit rather rare was Kevis Norwegi. <laughs> But uh, just in some other question, can you say a couple of words about the use of Eretz Israel, yeah. which in the last couple of years uh, has been uh, kind of confiscated by the political right? Oh. Uh, okay, uh, I will take a couple of questions and try to answer. Um, I want to ask how much do you think this uh, Territorizing of the Hebrew language also um, is uh, going to the Jews that didn't live in Israel. Um, if you look, for example, at the name of the Jewish communities in Europe, in Ashkenaz, in Germany, for example, they used to be called Israelitische Gemeinde, Israelitische Kultusgemeinde, and now most of them call most of them call themselves Jewish Gemeinde. Or, for example, Israelitische Krankenhaus, which are called today Jewish hospitals. <coughs> and I also heard, for example, newly that the, um, the new chef of the uh, Jewish Museum wants to bring more and more Zionist, uh, um, uh, the Zionist story into the Jewish story of the German uh, people. So how much do you think that it really influences Jews outside of Israel? Uh, outside of Israel? Jews outside of Israel is a contradiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I noticed uh, you use the term aggressive, confiscate. You know, there's a, a little bit of tension in the way you describe uh, Israel and Zionists. And, um, and I'm wondering also, you know, like I'm a diaspora Jew. And we say Meditano for Muns, we'll say the Medina, and this is not necessarily in a Zionist or pro Israel perspective. Uh, there's a certain chauvinism that exists within the Jewish people. That you can call it chauvinism, or you can call it uh, Ahavas as well, a certain love, love, of, love of Jews. You know, so that when you, um, when you look in the newspaper and somebody was killed, you look uh, for Jewish names. You know? Um, you ask, and then almost you have a sigh of relief. Like, no Jews were killed. Not, not to minimize the tragedy. But my, I find what you're saying a little bit kind of aggressive towards, is, towards the Zionists, as if they're the only ones that have this kind of chauvinism. If you go to any shul in Williamsburg, 
which is far from uh, Zionist, and they consider themselves the um, the holy remnant, you know. And the second question is, you completely ignored Sephardim and the Mizrahi. Yeah. And, you know, the language in Israel, yeah, Dabar Akher is maybe relevant to me, but not to the majority of Israel, which doesn't come from that heritage. And maybe there is a necessity in creating a new nation, which is multi-ethnic, to use a language that is more encompassing and positive. So that's my question for you. Thank you very much, Blas. I would like to take these questions. Okay. Okay. Um, let's begin with the uh, Israel. Right. Um, Eretz Israel. What I, the only thing that I can say about it is how the world is divided in the um, complexity of its ambiguity. It also came to signify Eretz Israel. Actually, people. I express this, it's the first time that I speak in a, in, a, in a lecture, but I spoke about it a lot of people, and a lot of people told me, what do you mean? For for, that, for years, for hundreds of years, Jews has called the land Israel, you know, Eretz Israel, which is of course not true. Uh, Eretz Israel was always Eretz Israel, uh, and the word Israel to refer to Eretz Israel is exactly an elegism of uh, post-48. The most interesting thing that you can see is the usage of, for me, from a linguistic point of view, I guess that you noticed that these are the sort of things interesting. Uh, the, um, the, the word Israel, for hundreds of years, for, from its beginning, uh, actually it's older, the word Israel is older than anything else that we have in Hebrew. It's actually maybe the oldest word that we know in Hebrew uh, from periods, but that's not the thing. Uh, Israel has always been a masculine noun, always. Okay? The idea that Israel Yefa, Israel Tova, uh, Israel Yehola, this has never been a part of, uh, uh, of, of, of Hebrew. And this is exactly something that can only be a result of this new ambiguity. Right? That Israel can now mean either the state, or the Jews, of course, can always also mean Jews, like Kol uh, Israel Chavarim, but it can also mean Eretz Israel, Israel Yefa. Right? And this is something that's complicated. I'm not sure if I answered completely what, what you are, were asking me. I was, I was curious about things like Eretz Israel Shema, like the concept moved to the right. <coughs> I think Eretz yeah. yeah, is like land and it's connected to the geographical, yeah? Yeah, of course. Place. Yeah. Geographical place. Yeah, Eretz is a very old term. I mean, it's a very traditional term that was used. And of course, ah, okay, maybe it's important to say that Eretz Israel is not uh, in, in, I mean, etymologically, it, is ne it has never been the land that is called Israel. Right? Eretz Israel, just like Medina Israel, meant the land of the Jews, right? like Deutschland. Okay? Deutschland is not a, a das Land Deutsch. Okay? Uh, Eretz Israel was the land of the Jews. This is how it was also conceptualized. And today, in our post anti diasporic Hebrew or anti diasporic Hebrew, we, uh, we don't know that anymore. We think of Eretz Israel as an opposition, the land that is Israel. More than that, uh, what you say about uh, how it uh, serves a political uh, Eretz Israel, yeah, maybe it's more used among right wing <coughs> Israelis, but uh, it's not, also, not really the topic of my okay. lecture. Wait, uh, now, uh, Gadi. Um, yeah, the, um, the influence on the on the diaspora, on the diaspora Jews, and also on the Hebrew diaspora <coughs> of all we are speaking about is huge. It's huge. Uh, let us begin with the fact that there are for, for decades uh, Zionist organizations that are uh, interested in educating uh, Jews all around the world in Hebrew, to teach them Hebrew, of course, teach them this kind of Hebrew, to give them these kind of textbooks. And the Hebrew that used to be in the diaspora is uh, gradually, constantly being replaced, updated by this Israeli Hebrew. Uh, you see it uh, even, even in Brit, Brit Olamit, the organization that was founded by Lovidovich to create Hebrew for the diaspora, by the diaspora, in the diaspora, <coughs> this organization exists to this very day. But it was completely co opted by the Zionist uh, movement. And it moves all around the world and has conferences. Even in Berlin, in the year 2000-something, there was a conference of Britis Britis where 
teachers, and Hebrew teachers all around the world, or, or other kinds of, of scholars, speak about how we can uh, engage more Jews to learn Hebrew with the, uh, of course, with the aim of getting them to be more involved with the politics uh, of the state of Israel, not to speak about uh, emigrating to the state of Israel. As for, <coughs> and of course, language usage, uh, not only among the diaspora Jews, also among the, uh, just, you know it better than me, uh, non-Jews who learn the Hebrew here, who say Haaretz, and some people find it funny, I find it sad, but uh, this is of course the, this, the, the monopoly that this Hebrew has achieved is so, is so big, so uh, um, total, that uh, it, it makes no sense to speak of, you know, it makes no sense to speak of the existence of Hebrews that were not touched by this, uh, by this process. And my, my father goes to an electrician in Brooklyn, a Jewish uh, electrician, a Haredi, an Orthodox electrician in, in, in Brooklyn, and they speak uh, Hebrew. And when my father for the first time told him, ah, so you speak Hebrew? He told him, no, 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 I speak Russian Kurdish. I don't speak Hebrew. Of course, he didn't speak with him Ashkenazi Hebrew with an Ashkenazi accent with Ashkenazi vocabulary. He spoke with him the same Hebrew that my father spoke to him. But he preferred calling it uh, the traditional, uh, with a traditional name. But of course, the, the influence is huge. <coughs> As for Israelitish and Yiddish, this is again a, a question of euphemisms. The word Israelitish, from the beginning, was a euphemism for Yiddish. Okay? Uh, Yiddish has become, uh, in the time of emancipation, uh, in the, maybe even in the late 18th century, I'm not sure if maybe Ofri can correct me, and of course in the 19th century, um, Yiddish has, has came to be connotated uh, as, as, as majority, and Israelitish has become the, the, the euphemistic way of referring to Jews, and now we see exactly the opposite, of course. And this is something that is also uh, found in the letters between Davidovich and Ben Gurion. They are fascinating letters, I'm broken, by the way, um, where, where Davidovich says, Jews, Yudin, that's like, that's not a traditional name for Jews. That is a name that was, that we adopted as a translation of the way the Gentiles call us. We call ourselves Israel, right? It's Israel. And Ben Gurion told him, no, 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 there's nothing bad about the word Jew. You are Jews now. Once you were, before 48, you were Israel, now you are Jews. Use this word, it's great. No, no problem with the word Jew. He really says it, and what you are saying and seems to confirm that they are changing from Israelitish to Jewish. Um, I hope that was good. Okay. Now, the violence, the aggressiveness, and the spouting. As for the aggressiveness, of course. My talk was about Hebrew as a diasporic language and about uh, the violence that has been done to it, uh, which, of course, this violence has become a part of it. I mean, this is, every change is violent. Every change in history is aggressive. We can lament it, we can criticize it in retrospect, but it, it has become a part of Hebrew. I don't think that... I, I think Rhetorically, it was important for me to show the aggressiveness of, of uh, this process, but um, I mean, this is always this is a fact, and we should live with it, and we should, from this, uh, uh, refine uh, maybe a new kind of view. Uh, this is not saying at all that, that the Zionists or the, those who negated the diaspora among Zionists, which were the majority, uh, were the only ones to be aggressive, right? Uh, if you look for them, for example, on uh, the uh, Yiddishist nationalists, people like Zhitlovsky, Chaim Zhitlovsky, uh, and other Bundists who completely rejected the usage of Hebrew, they were not less violent. They, ju they were just uh, erased from the pages of history. We don't know about them. Uh, they were the majority among, among Jews before the uh, Second World, World War. Now we don't, most of you know about the word Bund, but I'm not sure how many here have read, for example, Yiddishist. Uh, uh, the text, where you find the same kind of argument. Actually, Max Weinlein, who is the most important, well, most well-known linguist of Yiddish, takes the example of Mekah and Mechir exactly for this point. He says he heard Jabotinsky in Warsaw delivering a talk saying in Yiddish, 
right? It's going to cost us an uh, expensive price. And he says, why are you saying Mechir? Say Mekach. Mechir is Hebrew, right? The, 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 the war between Mechir or Mekach was from both sides, and there were, only, there were also more than two sides to this, and I just gave one. This was about one of them. And as for the Sephardim and Mitzrachim, um, I agree with you completely, and I also said it. Uh, with the example of Mecca, I think that that was a, a part of, of why I, I prolonged uh, my discourse on the way that it was uh, a, a, actually a heritage, a diasporic heritage that is much older than Ashkenaz. And also, I think that we here in Ashkenaz may, we don't have to begin this kind of exca excavation from Ashkenaz. I would offer you for your, for your pleasure to learn Yiddish, for example. Um, but this is not necessarily, this is not the only way to deal with it. It is my way to deal with it, or at least the first. Uh, but it's also important to say, as I was speaking about the transition between a certain Hebrew to another, as I was speaking about, right, 40, uh, the Second World War and 48 are the, the major dates in my talk, how I speak about the tra transition from a historic Hebrew to a Hebrew that its historicity is being negated, we should not forget that before the Second World War, ninety-five, a bit more than ninety-five percent <coughs> of the world Jews were Ashkenazi Jews, and the uh, language, how many? Ninety-three. Ninety-three. Well, Vinerich says more than ninety-five, but good. Maybe Vinerich was an Ashkenazi Jew, so he had the number more percent. Uh, I mean, this is nothing to say uh, uh, about. Uh, let's move uh, aside the, the linguist, fascinating linguistic questions uh, that we can, that we can uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, in, the, in the Arabic speaking areas, not only the Arabic speaking areas, also in, in, among Persian Jews and so on. Of course, this is all valid and great and important. No, great is something in my world. It's, it's very important to do this kind of research, but if we're speaking about the, 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 main, the main transformations that occurred, uh, we cannot escape that that uh, Ashkenazic Jews and the Yiddish as, a, as the mother tongue of the overwhelming majority of Jews at that, at that period uh, defines our uh, corpus to this. Uh, it's also important to say that the, 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 this distinction, this dichotomy between Ashkenazim and Mizrahim is something that was completely invented within the Zionist uh, 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 construct uh, uh, the Zionist construct in Palestine. Uh, this is not to say that they are not Mizrahi Jews. This is not to say that this identity that has been appropriated today uh, is, is, is an invented one. It is as invented as Ashkenazim is an invented. All identities are invented. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we should also not surrender, I think, also, it's a big word. We should not. Um, we should not yeah, surrender, okay, to this to this kind of dichotomy, uh, dichotomy that uh, the Zionist project uh, uh, gives us uh, that there are uh, Ashkenazi Jews and there are Jews. The word Mizrahi in Hebrew, not only in German, post Hebrew, in Hebrew, the word Mizrahi was used in those times that we speak about to refer to Eastern European Jews, right? They were the Mizrahim, okay? And now they stopped being the Mizrahim. The Poles and the Russians, like my family, became the Ashkenazim, which is, of course, ridiculous because Ashkenazi is German. And the Arabs, even if they came from Western Africa, from Morocco, they became the Mizrahim. So what we should do is excavate it. What we should do is deconstruct it and speak about it. And not say, wait a second, Wait a second, there has to be 50% uh, Ashkenazim, 50% Mizrahim, right? This kind of, of uh, um, <coughs> identity politics, I mean, we can speak about identity politics, but let's not inherit the identity politics that is given to us from the state of Israel as such. That's my answer to you. I hope satisfied. Well, that's that's the distinction between Ashkenazis and Sephardis. This distinction is something that was invented by Zionism? No, Mizrahi. Sephardi is a, is a, is a category that, uh, well, besides of the, of the different uh, versions of the Tfilah, of the, of the prayer, uh, it had also certain, uh, a certain tradition uh, within, um, within uh, 
Jew, Jewish, uh, Jewish writing. But of course, uh, the category that we not speak about today, the, the question that was given to me today, why don't you speak about Mizrahim, uh, is, is, is a product of this kind of uh, identity politics that, uh, of course, has absolutely no tradition. Of course, it's completely, I mean, everything is invented, but this was invented in the last. What are you trying to argue though? That, that for the moment of tragedy of, of, of the Yiddish loan words in the Hebrew, there's a certain um, no. there's a certain unity okay. in the language about the about the patterns. Okay. I don't I don't understand the I think this is your first uh, as the first uh, question. Yeah. Um, hold the microphone already. Um, thank you so much for your talk. This is very enriching. I was um, constantly asking myself since we were speaking about, as you said, about uh, anti-historic figures, we have like a very specific linguist critique of Zionism. I was asking myself, well, it might be blunt, but what is the historic Hebrew? And like, I, I just, I'm, I, we have a lot of syncretisms happening today in Berlin. Like, there's a magazine in Hebrew outside of Israel, there's things um, happening in Europe of Israelis who came here which revive a certain culture of, 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 of uh, the Hebrew language outside of Israel. But, Despite the, say, the, 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 the Turgic tradition of, of, uh, of um, Judaism, in, which is tremendous, obviously, but like, is there, is there um, as far as I know, there is no real, I mean, no community of language in modern history before Zionism, right? I mean, how have you, or wrong? Yeah. <laughs> so, I will send you my paper again. <laughs> Can you, can you, I mean, what would that kind of like this forest tradition, can, can you give an example of this kind of tradition? Like, of course, people speak in Hebrew, but like, how, how would you, like, how do you locate it, or how do you pose it to? Okay. Um, a bit more about the definition of uh, the diasporic. Uh, Language because it seems to me that there's a danger of, of becoming too metaphysical about it. Well, think of saying say a priori that the language is historic and then from there deducing every every aspect that it should have as a historic language, but uh, then uh, the question is it doesn't have existence doesn't the existence of the state of Israel today put us in a situation in which the fact is that that it's not Enough that it's correct to be the historic anymore. Uh, and the good example is that the fact that this talk is in English, while the Rambam wrote uh, in Hebrew, uh, in, uh, but, uh, which, uh, uh, in order that people can understand him, but then we cannot have a discussion in Hebrew here if you want uh, people not from Israel <laughs> to, to take uh, part of the discussion. Uh, so this okay, I will ask you. There were like three um, very short ones, most of them negative, I'm sorry. No, I, I do not uh, suggest to lament the disappearance of any uh, parts of the historic Hebrew. I suggest to, to be conscious of it. I suggest to excavate our language in order to, to rethink it. It's a process of of um, appropriating our own language. It's not a process of lamentation. I, I tried to make it clear. I'm not sure if maybe I, I made a, a bad job doing that. Um, as for, I think that the questions of Hanno and the last people were, were quite similar. Um, I think that um, that uh, well, well, I begin with Hanno. Um, part of the, of the Zionist um, or the anti diasporist historiography of Hebrew gives us this myth as if Hebrew was spoken and written and used in uh, Palestine, in uh, ancient times, in biblical times, then it was forgotten, then it was frozen, then suddenly. Out of north, it was revived and became a language of the state of Israel. Um, this actually was the topic of 
uh, the talk of my brother who sits here, Jan Heather, in the, uh, who spoke about it in Berlin, uh, was, was it two years ago? We are waiting for a follow-up. Yeah. We are waiting for a follow-up on that. And I gave a couple, a couple of citations, both older ones from Ozzy's life, as well as uh, recent ones from Gideon Goldenberg, that all also exposed, of course, I cannot in this topic explain how, how uh, constructed and false is this uh, narrative, how it was indeed spoken, written, read, read and used uh, among uh, Jews and also among non-Jews. This also will connect to another question. And, and throughout, uh, continuously, and since, uh, as I said, uh, 2,500 years, of course, not in the same uh, kind of um, production, not in the same kind of quantity as all languages, uh, but uh, the continuity that has been negated, it, I think it's part of, of um, what we should do. I mean, to learn, to read, to, to, to get to it, to, to try to, to find that there are a lot of people here, probably do not know. Hebrew was a very vivid language in Berlin in the 20s. People do not know that. People heard it maybe and thought there were some authors sitting here and writing the poem, but they do not know that what we are experiencing now, having cafes and talks and events in Hebrew, cafes drinking and speaking in Hebrew, writing, they had much more than we had. They had a Felage, obviously, and publishing houses in Berlin, many. Berlin was the center, in the centuries, was the center of Hebrew publishing in the entire world. And the greatest authors sat here, spoke and debated in Hebrew. Okay? Uh, this is just one example, there are many, many examples. Um, and these examples are something that we have, we have to, to, to investigate. Uh, and as for Adubim, uh, um, that Hebrew has uh, stopped being the historic and actually it's a fact, and our Hebrew is uh, um, handicapped or non diasporic and here we can only speak this kind of Hebrew that we import from another place. It's a question. I, I agree that it's a valid question. Um, it's a valid question whether you, if you look at, on it from in a, in a short uh, um, resolution, in a short term resolution, it does seem that Hebrew is mostly spoken and written and so on in one place in the world and we are just nothing in compared to that so we can just think of our language as, uh, I don't know, Israel. Yeah, it is it also Israel, it not, never said that it isn't, but it's as not valid, it's not capable of constituting a diasporic production. This, this is what I'm speaking of. On the other hand, if you look at, on it from a more uh, an historical, from a larger historical point of view, as I was trying to, to, to explain in my talk, you would see that Hebrew has done this again and again and again and again. Moved from one place to another, split, joined, went there, went there. People had all sorts of diasporic uh, 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 relations, and there were times where uh, in Spain, for hundreds of years, became Spain became the unquestionable center of Hebrew uh, in the world, and people in, in the land of Israel at the time could think, uh, what are we in, compar in comparison to the great uh, 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 cultural production that is done there. What I'm trying to tell you is that um, it is not deterministic. We can, we, if we look at history, we can take um, inspiration from it. If we were interested in doing that, if we're not interested in doing that, we wouldn't come to this evening and we wouldn't prepare this talk and we wouldn't have a, 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 I guess we weren't here yesterday because you just spoke about why we were speaking English and if you were here yesterday you would have seen that there were not, I don't know how many people are there you know that in Ashkenazic Jewish tradition we do not count people because it's a I know um, but there were at least uh, twice as much and uh, conversation was in Hebrew. Actually, it was many languages. It was a great diasporic uh, symbol. And I think it's also what is happening today is diasporic, in the, in the sense that I could have had this lecture delivered in Hebrew, and I already had uh, an event here, 
one year ago together with Gabby and Dana Rothschild, who is not here, and uh, Frilani, uh, where 70, approximately 60, 70 people came and it was completely in Hebrew with no translation, just Hebrew. This is what's so beautiful about Berlin that it is possible to do it now. Uh, the decision to do it in English, I, I think, is can also be justified in diasporic terms because I'm interested, and I hope that the people who do not know Hebrew, which is the minority, are also interested of, of seeing how they can relate in this um, intercultural uh, relationship. I remind you uh, the definition that I gave in the beginning of the talk that I draw from Daniel Boyarin, that uh, the diasporic condition is exactly this doubled cultural position that we can speak Hebrew, you and I, we can also speak Hebrew with people living all around the world, we can write and have a kind of community around Hebrew that has never ceased to, to, to exist for, as I said, 2,500 years, but we also, wherever we are, are engaged in the particular culture where we are. We constantly influence it and are being influenced with it. And Berlin is a great city in, the, in, the, in that sense because, look, we are not having this in German, but in Berlin. Where it's not true. Where well, the German is the language that, that uh, uh, would be the dominant one, right? The fact that we, have, we are here in Berlin, where the official language of the state is German, we have this talk in English, and we all have in the back of our heads Hebrew, and we speak about Hebrew, that's the truly diasporic moment. And I'm, I'm free to be in a very modern, contemporary sense. In my sense, yes. yeah. <laughs> there, there are no objective definitions of diaspora, only subjective. If people are still interested, I can take more. We will have uh, our last uh, question and then we can start. Okay. So thank you again, Fabri, it was fascinating and uh, so many questions in my head. It's the best time, I think. And I'm actually uh, starting exactly at the point where you uh, stopped your last answer. Don't you find it ironic a bit? that the revival of the so-called diasporic Hebrew is actually uh, happening through uh, Israel and all around the world and not through Jewish communities. And to emphasize that, I, I want to share with you um, uh, that I've been in touch with many uh, uh, Israeli content uh, uh, producers around the world and, and community leaders, if you, may, if you may say so, um, that all are pointing out that there is uh, almost no connection between the Hebrew communities or Israeli communities uh, around the world and the local Jewish communities. Uh, in that saying that actually within the Jewish communities today, Hebrew is no longer uh, a visit language. And I find it, and I ask myself if, if there's, if you ask you if, uh, if you think this would also change again, or is Hebrew now exclusively uh, uh, a diasporic, now with a new meaning of the diaspora uh, language, meaning a Galut language for Israel is coming from Israel and not from for local Jews. You don't even need to use the word Galut, you can also speak of an Israel, Israel diaspora, which many people do. Maybe even the. We have another last question if we want to. I thought I could get only one question. No problem. No problem. We'll take two. Yeah. Um, I'm going to speak in Greek. I think that באחד הדיונים שלו על איזשהו מאמר שהוא התייחס לפתרון בישראל בפלסטין, הוא דיבר על העניין שדווקא מתוך לא ציונות או אנטי ציונות חייבת להיות הכרה או איזשהו מהלך להכרה של ערבים בנוכחות היהודית ב... זאת אומרת, באפשרות של נוכחות יהודית, כן, בארץ, או סליחה. למה אני אומר את זה? כי אני חושב שבתוך המערך היפה של הסיק הזה, אתה מנסה איכשהו קצת להשאיר מחוץ לדיון את העניין של... אתה אומנם לא שולל את זה, וגם אמרת את זה בסוף, אבל את העניין של אותה... 
אוכלוסייה של אנשים דוברי עברית שחיים שם. ואני חושב שהצורה הזאת היא יוצרת קצת איזשהו סוג של אקסקלוסיביות בפועל, בשביל, בסופו של דבר, עם הארץ שהעברית היום, אנשים שהם... אולי אנחנו יכולים להיות לא מרוצים ממה שהם מצביעים בבחירות או משהו כזה. וזה אנשים שלא יכולים להשתתף בערב כזה ולדבר באנגלית, כי הם לא כאן, והם לא מדברים אנגלית. ויש חפיפה מאוד ברורה כאן בין ה... זאת אומרת, לא בדיוק לא מדברים אנגלית, אבל לא יכולים לעסוק ולהשתייך לאוונגרד הזה, שנגיד... והסכנה לדעתי שזה עלול להיות קצת כמו משהו שקצת מקביל לשלילת הגלות בכיוון ההפוך. זאת אומרת, אנשים, אנחנו ש, שבונים כאן איזה עולם אה, חדש, אה, ומתייחסים לאלה שנשארו מאחורה בתור מישהו ש... מה לעשות, טוב, אתם חייבים שייכים איזשהו עולם שהולך להיחרב, אה, וחבל. זאת אומרת, <laughs> זאת אומרת, זה בעיה שלכם. ו... <laughs> כל מה שאני אומר זה ש... אולי בשונה ממאבק בתוך ישראל שהוא חייב להיות באיזושהי צורה מיליטנטית, אני חושב שסוג כזה של מהלך תרבותי צריך להיות עם קצוות רכים באיזושהי צורה, כי אחרת פשוט נוצר כאן איזה מין גבול בין שתי אוכלוסיות שרק מקצים את שתי העמדות. אירוני, and also revival, towards the time I'm skeptic about. Uh, first of all, there's no revival. I don't like this word revival because it never, never died. There's no revival. There is a, a cultural production, uh, but to see... Speak about the 20s. Uh, were there any uh, book? Okay. No. I understand what you're saying. In that sense, we agree. But the metaphors of life and death, the, meta the metaphors of an organism, Right? I think that this is part, and this I take from my brother here, Smiles, yeah. Uh, but also it's something that uh, I spoke about, and uh, uh, also take from Ozen's mind. I, I, I think they're very dangerous and unproductive metaphors to speak about languages. Languages are not or living organisms. They do not die. People who speak those languages may die. And this is a political thing to say, okay? Languages do not die. Speaker, people who speak them die. And languages do not revive. Languages do not die and do not revive, they are dead, they are languages. We can do something with them, but we cannot... This is magic, this is mythology, which is national mythology, to, to speak about revival. Not there are also, a lot of people here spoke about uh, my presumed uh, notions of uh, creating a new national community. I'm not interested in creating any new national community, not interested in, in reviving anything, interested in making with you here and in culture. Um, but I will not escape your question, which is very important, about the Israelis. Uh, I agree with you, uh, in the sense that, uh, I mean, I, agree with you. I think it's great. I think it's great that Israelis, uh, who are also Jews, who are also diasporic Jews, who forgot it for a while, for a very limited portion of time, uh, but they are still also Israelis. They have already a new identity. Uh, but they also have other identities to discover, have this possibility to have this hybrid identity and a constant search. I think this is a great thing. Uh, 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 I, also think that, I also think that diaspora uh, Jews or people who did not move to, to, to Israel and, and speak or not speak or will speak Hebrew uh, will also contribute and can contribute. Right now, uh, there is a huge potential of Israeli immigration uh, I think especially to Europe and especially to Berlin. We have seen Israeli immigration to the United States since the beginning of times. I mean, since the beginning of times of the St. Louis, uh, which did not accumulate in any kind of cultural alternative, in any kind of, of uh, culture that sees itself uh, in terms that 
hopefully spoke about it exclusively in Islam, I will get to tell you. And which I think is a great thing. I think it's an amazing thing and I think there's a huge potential and I would say even more, and this is I waited for it, but I will say it again. Go and learn Yiddish because you are you go and learn Yiddish. Because you are exactly the perfect people to learn Yiddish. We me. Me also. I mean to be in Israel where Yiddish is in the back of the world without you know anything. To go to Germany with your Hebrew, to learn German, to go to this place, and then to learn Yiddish. There are so many things that you learn about yourself. There are so many things that you learn about your identity, that you learn about your, your culture. Uh, and I think that, that, that I think that there will be people who will do it. I really hope that they will. If I can help them do it, I would. Uh, I think that this is part. This is part of the of the of the movement. There will be many different uh, parts uh, of this movement. Of course, there are also um, it connects the question of Ashkenazi and not Ashkenazi. Though I recommend learning Yiddish regardless of this question. I think that. Uh, uh, I don't know why, I don't know see why you see it as ironic. I see it as great. I think it is, I think it is, it is fantastic that people with diasporic um, dormant identities go back to the diaspora, engage with it, engage with its culture, and this will happen anyway. And I think that about the other question about the separation, I mean, of course, the separation between Jewish communities uh, and the new Israeli ones that we see all around the world. And I also see it as connected, of course, to the ideology of negation of the diaspora. This is something that I see here again and again and again. Israelis come to believe, but they don't want to hear about Jews. They don't want to hear about the Jewish identity. They're not interested in Jewishness. They say, we are not Jews. We have nothing to do with Jews. And this, I think, is a projection of this ideology. This idea that, how can I come here to Europe and not be a diasporic Jew, because the diasporic Jew, as we all have seen in Facebook recently, that the, the notion of the diasporic Jew, and I'm referring to this video that is circulating about the... Uh, of the, uh, the <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, sure. you don't know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, I will send it to you, okay? It's a video, a video that, that reminds all of us how vivid is the negation of the diaspora uh, still is, uh, you know, in, in, Israeli, in Israeli culture, and I think that there's a clash. There's a clash of Israelis coming to Europe, and this clash is also interesting. And um, I think, like my projection, I'm not a prophet. I think that eventually there will be a Oshmore, a, a coming together of, of um, local Jewish communities and, and new Israeli. Yeah, eventually. I think it all only happens. Of course, the question is how much, right? But. Uh, to tell you the truth, it's all so interesting and it's also, I mean, it's also fertile for, for, for cultural production that I, I don't think there's a, there's a goal here to make them become this or them, you see what I'm saying? This is not important for me to tell people, learn about your Jewish identity. It's not interesting. Each person will come with his own, with his own uh, answer. It will be, uh, the only thing that would be interesting is if, it, if people will engage in these questions, if people will try. And I think they, they do. You saw it also yesterday. You saw Gandhi explain why he uh, was so interested in, in uh, translating the correspondences between Anna and Sholem because it's something that touches all of the questions that he asks himself daily about the assimilation, about what does it mean to be the last word, the last word, and so on. And I think that uh, as long as we, we keep having these sort of events and we keep having this sort of, of uh, um, buzz, if you want, uh, things will be very interesting. And this is also my, my answer to you, hopefully. Um, great! I mean, bring them. Do something about it. Uh, uh, let's speak about uh, those who were left behind. I, I don't think that this is behind and this is uh, the front. I, I don't subscribe to this. Uh, but if, if I mean, uh, this is... And what, what I'm fascinated by is the fertility, the, poten the potential of this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, contact, this kind of, of, of uh, encounter that we can have here, especially in Berlin. Uh, something that I'm missing, now I'm living in Paris, I miss it extremely, this kind of things that we have here. And uh, um, I mean, 
you say to yourself that these uh, soft uh, edges were also part of my lecture and are part of my changing uh, um, points of view. Right? We spoke two years ago and you heard much more militant uh, opinions. I mean, probably your question uh, relates to things that you heard from me in a previous uh, um, formulation, and this is also part of uh, what, I mean, I, I say it uh, very openly, I change my, my opinions every day, and I think that uh, uh, this is what happens when you live in Berlin and treat these kind of questions, and this also an answer why my journal, Mikan Verlach, uh, is uh, stalling, is delayed so much, uh, because every time, uh, there's a change, there's a change. And the only thing that we should do is give this change representation. Right? To, 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 to make it into cultural production. If in the end there will be Israeli communities, Jewish communities, Israel, if Israel, the state of Israel will cease to be a state of Israel, become the state of X or not, or whatever, there will be another state of Israel, another Biro Bijar, doesn't matter. Let's do this. Let's continue doing what we're doing because this is. This is the most fascinating.